<coughs> okay, so um, just to complete the answer uh, to Enes question, does Israel have any connections with the IAEA? First of all, remember, IAEA was established in 1957 before the MPT, I mean, like uh, 11, 12 or so years before MPT was uh, sort of signed and opened it to ratification. Um, the, uh, Israel is a member of the IAEA, just like Pakistan, India. India and Pakistan as well as Israel, they stay out of the MPT, but they are members of the IAEA because IAEA is older than MPT. But if you ask the question whether there is any inspection agreements between the IAEA and the Israeli nuclear facilities or Israeli government, no, there is no such thing. So Israeli nuclear facilities are not inspected by the IAEA, which is not possible because IAEA, the Israel is not a member of the MPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. All right. Um, well, I'm using this PowerPoint, and if you, whenever you have time, you can just, you know, click on this on my website and just go through. But I'm spending a little bit time about every aspect that are stated here, because it is not only about Iran's nuclear ambitions. It is something which is at the core of today's discussions with respect to the Middle East and also with respect to the rest of the world. So, I mean, I am trying to use this uh, as a template whereby I can extend our discussion to many other issues here. So, if we are slow in advancing in these slides, does not mean that we are spending too much time on the Iran issue, but just look around you. And what you see is discussion or talking about Iran only. Of course, with uh, uh, different issues, with different aspects of the, or with different dimensions of the problem. So, uh, I think we have uh, said enough about why the United States is concerned about Iran's nuclear capabilities, because the United States, which is very much concerned about its security, of course, as well as the security of Israel, and knowing that Iran, at least from the perspective of Israel and the United States, is a challenge and threat to the Israeli security, the United States spends so much time in considering as to what to do with Iran's nuclear capabilities. So, therefore, this issue is important, and bearing in mind that we do not yet, as of today, have a clear picture of the Iranian nuclear capabilities, we can understand why the United States is concerned. Because, well, even in its most recent report of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency's Board of Governors stated that they cannot say exactly with confidence that Iran does not have the capability to produce nuclear weapons. Neither can they say that Iran produces nuclear weapons. They say, we are not positioned to make any comment whether Iran develops nuclear weapons or doesn't have any intention or capability to do so. So the, the situation is unclear. And the lack of clarity is confirmed by the highest authority, the most objective or impartial authority, which is the IAEA. IAEA is a technical body. It, 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 I mean, of course, it has not to be politicized, and so far, at least to the extent that I can see, the director generals of the IAEA have done their best not to politicize the IAEA and not to be used as a tool to advance some of the arguments of some of the countries. And as we will see in the coming slides, Neither the United States is happy with the IAEA's performance, nor Iran. So actually, this is a good sign. So both sides are complaining about the IAEA, meaning that neither side is happy, meaning neither side is satisfied because, I mean, because both, I mean, either, both sides actually want IAEA to uh, serve its own purpose. And the IAEA tries to be impartial, and for reasons that we will explain in a moment. The EU's position, which was back in 2006 when I used that, prepared a slide for this NATO uh, school, 
uh, for that presentation. At that time, the EU's position was slightly, indeed, when we look at some of the uh, most recent statements made by the European leaders, significantly, indeed, different than what it, it, it is today. So the EU actually agreed with the United States on that, I mean, that the Iran's capability is a threat. I mean, the EU never said Iran is not a threat at all, but they agreed on the uh, sort of uh, existence of a certain degree of threat, but they disagreed on the level or the, the imminence of the threat, and also what to do with it or how to deal with it. So the EU agreed with the United States that on that, you know, Iran's capabilities are posing a certain threat, and they also want, EU also wants uh, EU, uh, Iran to halt uranium enrichment, to stop uranium enrichment. They agree with the United States on this particular issue, but they disagree. The EU disagrees with the United States on how to do it, on the ways and means of dealing with Iran. Again, a, at a quick look, then we will have more extensive and detailed discussions about each actor's uh, position. Russia disagreed with the request of both the United States and the EU, which was the Iran's permanent uh, st stopping enrichment, um, but supported and also supported Iran's right under the MPT. And Russia's position also changed a little bit, not significantly, not drastically or radically, but and I will explain also why uh, Russia's position has changed, which in my personal opinion, and I have my reasons to believe this, and I could write an op-ed on this subject, and, um, and I've written something actually uh, on the built-in of the uh, atomic scientists, which is available on my website, as you might have seen already. Uh, Russia disagreed with the request uh, of both the United States and the EU, and support Iran's right under the MPT. Well, after all, according to Russia, Iran is using its uh, treaty rights, and there is nothing wrong that can be proven as being wrong that Iran is doing. Of course, from the Israeli perspective, well, which is a country which uh, uh, takes its decisions based on its security, almost on all uh, occasions, and among other things, they do not rule out the possibility of a military attack on Iranian facilities. And I Israel sees Iran as a clear challenge or threat to its vital interests as well as its existence. And therefore, they are concerned about Iran's advancing its capabilities. And if the international community fails to stop Iran's advancement of, of its capabilities and developing nuclear weapons, Israel says we will take certain measures which might also include a military attack on the facilities in order to destroy these capabilities that Iran uh, might develop uh, nuclear weapons. Of course, here the position of the IAEA is that, I mean, the IAEA wants to do its job, which is to go to places, carry out inspections, have a clear picture of what the situation is, and to write its report and, and come to a conclusion. But IAEA cannot verify the allegations of Iran's nuclear uh, work, but they cannot sort of uh, also give or write a, a clean bill of health. They can neither say Iran is building a weapon, nor can they say Iran is not building a weapon. So it's like an unmovic situation. Remember in Iraq, uh, so 1284, et cetera, et cetera. So the positions of these actors in a, in a uh, very brief manner is like this. So let's start with Iran in, in, with, uh, for more detailed uh, discussion. Iran's, Iranian leaders say that they will never agree to permanent cessation of enrichment on the grounds of their Article 4 right, rights of the MPT. So, that was actually the basic bargain. The first four articles of the MPT are the most important for at least your purposes because according to Article 1, nuclear weapon states uh, pro promise not to give nuclear technology or weapons to non-nuclear weapon states. 
I mean, United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom, according to Article 1 of the MPT, they bound, they commit themselves not to give nuclear technology or nuclear weapons to other states. So, let's say Article 1, nuclear weapon states, they will not give weapons to non-nuclear weapon states. And Article 2, of course, you should go and read these articles which are available on the web. Just click on the Google um, MPT treaty or MPT text. You will get the full text of the MPT or just uh, the, the text must be available um, in some of the uh, reading assignments that I gave uh, for this course. And Article 2 says non-nuclear weapon states will not look for weapons. I mean, they will not even show any inclination to do so. They will not even express any desire to do so. So non-nuclear weapon states will remain non-nuclear. They will not uh, pursue nuclear weapons. Article 3, there comes the IEA into play because states might make promises but how can you make sure that states keep their promises? You need to have an impartial organization which must be empowered to, empowered with the capability to carry out inspections to write a report about what exactly the non-nuclear weapon states are doing with the capabilities that they develop either by themselves or by way of transfers from other countries. So the IAEA, remember again, the model protocol and for some additional protocol, go to states, facilities, carry out inspections, and after these inspections, they write a report about the standing, about the position of that state, whether there is anything that, that really makes them concerned about the true picture or if everything is clear. So it is essential that the IAEA give a clean bill of health saying that, yes, I went to this country according to the safeguards agreement that we have, then I sort of spent so many days of inspections, so many man hours of inspections in this and that facilities, and I have found nothing wrong, and there's nothing wrong with this country. This is, this is what the IEA is looking for. But if the IEA goes to a country, carry out, carries out inspections, and if it encounters with some difficulties in, in terms of fulfilling all these inspections or terminating these inspections, or if there are certain sort of material that are missing and there is no clear explanation by the authorities about the status of that material, then the IAEA writes a report like, well, we have carried out inspections in this and that facilities. There's nothing wrong here. There's nothing wrong there. But we are not sure about the status of this particular facility and we need further clarifications but the authorities have not provided this clarification, so, you know, this is the situation. Then the Board of Governance of the IAEA may ask from that country's authorities, based on the report that the IAEA must have written already, and ask for further clarifications. And there is no further clarification coming from that state after the inspections, according to the point that was raised by the IAEA, then the Board of Governors might take the issue to the United Nations Security Council. So the IAEA itself does not deal with the country beyond a certain limit all by itself. It, its task is to go to these countries, carry, carry out inspections, try, I mean, find if something there is, there is wrong, and give a clean bill of health if everything is fine, and raise some questions if there are certain questions to be raised. And then the Board of Governance takes control of the situation, asks for further clarification. If there is no clarification coming, the issue can be transferred to the UN Security Council, as has been the case in the case of Iran lately, not at the beginning. So this is the uh, article, uh, this is Article 3. And Article 4, well, of course, if you commit yourself not to produce weapons, and if you commit yourself to accept inspections 
there must be something as a reward, something in return, which is expressed in Article 4, that is part of the bargain, you will be allowed to get nuclear technology transfer and the IAEA will help you in, in getting this technology or developing yourself by yourself this nuclear technology. So according to the Iranian leaders, the Article, Article 4 rights I mean, uh, are being used by Iran, nothing else is being done. So this is the official position of Iran. They say we do not do anything wrong and according to Article 4 we have the right, Iranians say, to enrich uranium and to repossess plutonium. Well, Iran did not repossess plutonium in large quantities. As far as I know, something that I discussed with the Iranian authorities when I was there in 2004 and possibly in 2005, they say that they had actually a German scientist had repossessed at a laboratory scale in one laboratory a minute quantity of uh, plutonium, which is not significant for weapons purposes, but it is significant for demonstrating or developing your capability to reprocess plutonium, because it's a very complex process. It is something that requires advanced technology and scientific knowledge. And even if you do it at very low levels or small quantities, well, it might not be significant for weapons development, we cannot develop nuclear weapons with 200 grams of plutonium. You need at least 8 kilograms, 7, 5 kilograms, whatever, depending on your technological capabilities. But if you can do it for a small scale, at low levels, I mean a small scale, then this is something that tells us, the world, that Iran might have at least the basic capability to process plutonium. But what is more important than that in the Iranian case is the capability to enrich uranium. It just, as I just wrote here on the board, Iran had this Natanz facility which may host 55,000 centrifuges, but at present not all of them there. They have installed, according to different sources, there are different figures, there, they have installed something in between 6,000 to 8,000 centrifuges, and not all of them operate every day. And what I follow from the international sort of a, a community of scientists and think tanks, uh, information that are supplied by this, these sources, of course, you cannot make sure about the veracity, about the uh, uh, sort of uh, correctness of this information, but most people rely on these informations provided by some uh, credible institutions. There is this information out that some 6,000 or 8,000 of them have been installed and out of this, this amount, 4,000 or 5,000 of them are operating on a daily basis and Iran is capable of producing like, something like 30 kilograms per, uh, or three, sorry, three or four kilograms per day. Well, it depends, uh, of course, if there's any enrichment. So, enrichment as well as reprocessing are such technologies that are not proscribed by the MPT, that are allowed by the MPT, provided that enrichment and reprocessing are used only and only for peaceful purposes. You might ask this question, yes, we understand enrichment because you need low enrich uranium, 3.5% uh, uranium for nuclear reactors. What about plutonium? There are certain uh, reactors fast breeder reactors, such as the ones in Japan, which use plutonium as fuel. So in order to run the nuclear reactor in Japan, almost all of them are plutonium-based reactors, some 50 plus or of them. Fatih asked me during the break if Japan has the capability to produce nuclear weapons. Well, having the capability of course, does not necessarily mean that they have the will, hopefully, to build the bomb. But there is this discussion in the international community that um, if a country has the capability, technological capability, to build a bomb, it is a matter of political decision. And therefore, it's a matter of time for that country to develop weapons. Hopefully, at this at present time, and when we look back, there is no indication that Japan might even think of 
developing nuclear weapons. And if you say something like that, Japanese are really getting furious because they say they are the only victims of nuclear weapons in the world. And how can we think about Japan building nuclear weapons? But some people do not look at this emotional part of the issue and look at the capabilities. And if and when Japan decides to develop nuclear weapons, can they do so? And the answer is unfortunately yes, because Japan has the technological capability, scientific accumulation, plus, more important than that, plutonium, which is much more than necessary for their 54, 55, whatever the number is, uh, nuclear reactors. So, of course, Japan is most likely remain peaceful for the foreseeable future, but there is this talk of what Japan might do in case the United States withdraws its umbrella, its secure umbrella, on top of uh, Japan, and if North Korea develops further capabilities for nuclear weapons, and if the two Koreas, South and North Korea, are you know, joining and then reuniting, and then they still keep their nuclear weapons, then Japan might consider developing nuclear weapons. So therefore, it is a matter of intentions plus capabilities. Plus capabilities. Japan has the infrastructure, the capability, of course, hopefully not the intention, but in the, for, uh, in the future, we don't know. Don't, don't forget, capabilities take time to develop. I mean, it, in order for a country to develop nuclear weapons capability, it might spend billions of dollars and tens of years and therefore, capabilities are taking time to develop, but intentions can change, if not overnight, but in a very short time. So therefore, you have to keep an eye on both the capabilities as well as intentions, and depending on which sort of a term you look at the situation. So, going back to the rights within under the MPT. According to the MPT, non-nuclear weapon states such as Iran must not develop nuclear weapons, must open its uh, facilities to the IA inspections, and in return for this, they can acquire technology by way of transfers from other countries or by way of indigenous development. So Iran say, says here, what I'm doing, enrichment, it is my inherent right, coming from the MPT's Article 4, and therefore I will never stop using my right, and therefore I will never agree to a permanent cessation of enrichment. Because the West is concerned about Iran's enrichment capabilities, because once you are capable of enriching uranium from its natural level, 0.7% to 3.5% for nuclear reactor use, then Actually, there are not many hurdles, I mean, uh, there are not many obstacles in front of you to develop um, nuclear weapons because once you have the technology and capacity or capability to enrich from natural level to 3.5 or 5 percent, you can enrich up to 90 percent for weapons purposes. So the West says Iran, by way of investing in uh, enrichment, and also not only uh, and, and this, but also doing this clandestinely, because from 1984 to 2002, Iran did not declare its enrichment facility to the IAEA, to the world. And this, they say, is an intention of their, uh, is an indication of their intentions, that they are going to uh, pr produce nuclear weapons in the future. This is what the West says. Iranians also say they will end cooperation with the IAEA if sanctions are imposed on Iran. Well, that was before the IAEA uh, took the dossier, the file of, the, uh, of, of Iran to the United Nations Security Council. Because uh, after the revelations of the Iranian opposition group, as I said during the first hour, the Director General of the IAEA gave this ultimatum to Iran to sign uh, the additional protocol by the end of October 2003, and by that time, 
three European countries, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, sent their foreign ministers to Tehran, and they, they sort of, uh, they, they went to Tehran, talked with the Iranian of, uh, officials, and Iran agreed to sign the addition protocol. That was either late October or early November 2003. And then they have, they have not signed anything, everything was on promises, and Iran started to act after signing the uh, additional protocol as if it was a party to the additional protocol, that is, as if the Majlis, the Iranian Majlis, the parliament, as if it, it had uh, ratified the protocol and cooperated with the IAEA. And of course, in return for this, the EU3, European Union three countries, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, they made some pr promises, economic, they provided some economic incentives, political incentives, encouragements. So there was a, a sort of a milder climate between Iran and the West. When I say West, I mean here Europe, because the United States found that actually as a waste of time, consider this, this, this initiative of the EU as a waste of time, but actually as we will discuss later on, it was also something that served the United States' interest because the United States was not or had not decided what to do and was not ready to do anything. So therefore, in the meantime, the European Three kept Iran under certain control and imposed in a sort of a, a acceptable level certain conditions on Iran such as to cooperate with the IAEA to the extent possible. So Iran and the IAEA have started a cooperation which was more than the model protocol, which is weak of the 1970s, but less than the additional protocol because it was not yet entered into force. If, I, if you want to sleep, you can go out. Okay. Um, so therefore, if you have headache, you don't have to stay here. You can go to the arms. Okay. So, um, this is something that Iranians said, I mean, they will cease cooperation, they will stop cooperation with the IAEA because after 2005 June elections when Ahmadinejad came to power and after having made some statements, you, you might remember, he said uh, Zionism must be swept out of the surface of earth, something like that. And of, of course, he said Zionism, he did not Israel, but actually there is not much difference between Zionism and Israel. So Israel saw this as a clear challenge, clear threat to its vital interest and existence. And European leaders also have seen this extreme statements as inimical, inimical to uh, sort, of, um, sort of Iran's uh, uh, relations with, with the West. So we have started to hear certain statements from the West, especially after Sarkozy uh, came to power um, in, in France and Merkel came to power in, in Germany, they were much more concerned than their predecessors in France and Germany, as well as in, in the United Kingdom. So in some respects, the statements of Ahmadinejad frightened, caused fear among the European leaders because um, Hatemi, who was the predecessor of uh, Ahmadinejad and who stayed as the uh, Iranian president for eight years from 1997 uh, to uh, 2004, uh, actually he, his, his stance was much more milder when compared to Ahmadinejad and Ahmadinejad's statements came one after another shortly after he, presumed, he assumed the presidency, I mean he assumed the office, he started as the president. So the European leaders were shocked, and not, of course, the only, only the Israelis, but the Europeans themselves. And I heard many Israelis saying, well, Ahmadinejad could not have done a bigger favor if he were the president of Israel. So the statements that he made with respect to Israel actually convinced the Europeans in such a way that the Israelis themselves could not convince them. So Israel was trying to explain to the Europeans, the, the, the EU3 in particular, that cooperating with Iran would not bring anything and that they would give or gain Iran some more time for developing their nuclear weapons, but Europeans were not agreeing to that. So they said, 
uh, or they were hopeful about the, the end result of the process, that you know, EU trees initiative would prove successful, etc. So once Ahmadinejad made all these statements, European leaders said, well, maybe Iran is not the Iran that we think, or maybe it is the Iran that the Israelis are telling us. So uh, the Iranian situation or the, the, the perception of Iran started to change with the statements made by the, by, uh, the Iranian President Ahmadinejad and the Europeans' position actually started to change slightly. So they started to talk about imposing sanctions because Iran, although was apparently seemingly cooperating with Iran, with, with the IAEA, Iran was not uh, sort of uh, agreeing to everything the European Union asked ask from Iran, one of which was the permanent cessation of enrichment. They never stopped enrichment fully, except for some short period. So therefore, the United States on the one hand, and the new European leaders on the other hand, plus Russia for other reasons that I will explain, have started to uh, sort of uh, uh, increase the heat, the pressure on Iran to comply with some of the requirements or expectations of the international community. Otherwise, they, they threaten Iran with uh, sanctions. And Iran said in return, if you are sort of going to threaten me with sanctions, then I will end cooperation. So there was a stalemate. Then therefore the EU3 stopped its uh, initiative and from mid-2005 until last year, there was no actually substantial uh, negotiations between the West or the EU uh, and Iran. So uh, actually there is another issue that we must state here, something that I also personally observed when I was in Iran or in other countries, especially in the Islamic countries, in the Gulf, on, in other parts of the world. What I have seen was the um, uh, sort of the policy of Iran to mobilize as much support as possible, especially among the Islamic nations. Of course, they use this leverage, Islam as a leverage, in advancing their position. And of course, they also benefited from uh, the, the already existing anti-American feelings, anti-Israeli feelings, anti-Semitic feelings, and therefore Iran used this sort of uh, anti-American, anti-Western, anti-Israeli feelings among the uh, Eastern world, Islamic world, also in the non-aligned countries to sort of mobilize support for its own position in the international community, especially within the body of the United Nations. So, and for instance, among other things, in their relations with the non-aligned movement, they promised the non-aligned countries, as well as Turkey. I mean, I know from my conversation with the Iranians, and I also read um, on the, on, in the press, on papers, during some of the visits uh, of the Iranian high-ranking officials, as well as Ahmadinejad himself, that they offered cooperation in, in, in dev developing technology, nuclear technology, in a cooperative manner. So Iran said to the, or told the non-aligned movement countries, look, you are not going to get nuclear technology from the West because they, they have this preferential uh, treatment. They do, they do give technology to the countries that they wish to give, and they do not give to other countries, and look what they do to me, and if you support me and protect me against all these sanctions and everything, I have advanced my capabilities and I can share this technology with you. So Iran, in a sense, promised uh, technology transfer from Iran to non-aligned movement countries or Islamic countries if, they, if Iran uh, would be supported by them. So, uh, as I just mentioned, anti-Americanism and anti-Israeli feelings played into the end, uh, head of the Iranians. Um, as you can see, uh, Iran wanted to become a potential nuclear supplier. Well, well in some respects, this is true. Iran has developed I mean, is now building a 
heavy water reactor, which is, again, an advanced technology. It is a small one, but not that small, and big enough for weapons production, because for enough plutonium production, which can be extracted by way of reprocessing later on. They have developed enrichment technology based on the Pakistani design, which was provided to Iran by uh, the uh, Abdul Qadir Khan, the Pakistani scientist. All, there are all these allegations, and I believe I uh, true. And I have reasons to believe, and I cannot say right in front of these cameras. But um, so, for the record, at least uh, I can tell you that this is true. So. Um, Therefore, these are uh, the reasons or the, 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 the leverages that Iran used in order to advance its position in the international community. Anti-Americanism, anti-Israeli feelings, Islamic states. Well, actually, this is also important. Non-aligned movement countries do not want Iran to give in to the pressures of the United States. Because if Iran, I mean, stops uh, enriching uranium or acts the way uh, the West asked from Iran to do, to act, then non-aligned movement countries will see Iran as another, as another example of Western imperialism. So they want Iran to defy all this pressure and to stand, stand up against all this pressure. So therefore, non-aligned non movement countries support Iranian position or at least at a rhetorical level. So therefore, uh, they, don't, they don't want Iran to be a bad precedent for them. Because if today Iran, which is a powerful country, uh, militarily, economically, politically, and otherwise, so if, they, if Iran cannot stand up against all this pressure, how could they stand up against this, stand against this pressure in the future? So they don't want Iran to set a bad precedent for selective mistreatment. Again, as I said, they see Iran as a potential supplier. So this is, therefore, uh, important. The United States position, we talked a little bit about, this, about, about it. But again, um, yes, we know that the United States considers Iran as a threat. I mean not only with all the other military capabilities that Iran has, but also with, and more specifically, with the nuclear capability that Iran develops, and a threat to its US interest, Israel, as well as the Gulf region. But in return for this, I mean, how to, I mean, mitigate the threat or how to manage this situation, their policy is what can be this is something that is agreed upon by many scholars in the international community. It is what is called stick-only policy. You might have heard this carrots and sticks. And some people, especially in the third world countries, they don't want to hear this carrots and sticks. They say, we are not rabbits. We are human beings. So how can we be treated with sticks and carrots, etc.? But carrots and sticks policy, it's, it's a is a statement which is widely used in international uh, literature, international relations literature. Carrots mean encouragements, incentives, and sticks mean punishment. But the United States pursues no carrot and stick policy, but rather stick only policy, something that I use in my uh, articles as well. And they, the United States wants Iran to take cer certain steps before the United States starts taking some steps that Iran expects from the United States. So therefore, it is not something like, you do something now, and my, I do something now, and then next step, we do some other things. No, the United States says, you do this and that and this and that, and then I may consider doing or acting the way you expect from me to act. So therefore, it is the only policy, and it doesn't take us anywhere. Um, of course, the United States has limited economic and diplomatic leverages and faces difficulties in dealing with Iran because the United States does not have diplomatic relations and nor, neither do they have any economic relations that we know. Well, I underline this part because 
after the first Gulf War, uh, that was a policy which was started with, with the Bush administration, but right after the first Gulf War in 1991, at the end of 91, there was, I mean, this uh, presidential elections in the United States, and Clinton came to power. And one of the policies that the Clinton administration pursued was uh, the, the uh, uh, encirclement policy. Uh, I mean, they wanted Iran and Iraq not to advance their capabilities, not to sort of earn lots of revenues from international trade. So, which was called dual containment. Dual containment policy, I'm sorry this board market doesn't write anything. Dual containment, like containment of the Soviet Union by the United States right after the World War II. So dual containment aimed at containing Iran and Iraq together because they were seen as uh, threats to the Middle East peace process with, which had already started between Arab nations and uh, Israel. So Iran and Iraq, which could provoke this Middle East peace process, had to be contained by the Clinton administration. At that time, in the early 1990s, Iran's nuclear capabilities were, of course, of concern for the United States, but not that much. The level of concern increased uh, dramatically after the revelations about the clandestine enrichment facility in Natanz in 2002. And prior to that, and prior to 2000, 2001, September 11, Iran's level of threat was always there, but not as high as it is today. So the dual containment aimed at containing Iran and Iraq and prevent them from provoking anything that could disturb the Middle East peace process. And the United States imposed sanctions on Iran, imposed sanctions on its own companies, and also asked from the European allies not to do trade with Iran and Iraq. But in the second half of the 1990s, it was so uh, learned or uh, known by the international community that the second biggest uh, trade partner of Iran actually was a group of American companies under the guise of or uh, some other companies which were not directly of course uh, making trade with, the, with Iran but uh, using some partner companies or some uh, sort of uh, other techniques they were still doing business with Iran and when the European countries learned this they got furious because they had imposed sanctions on their or limitations on their own companies and asked from them not to do business with Iran, but they have learned after some time that some large American companies were doing business behind the doors through some uh, companies, uh, uh, parent companies or other companies, some business with Iran. So therefore, the uh, United States policy of dual containment just collapsed. But today, of course, there is no such an indication, at least uh, to the extent that we know, and the United States has therefore limited uh, economic and diplomatic leverages. And therefore, the United States uh, does not have much common ground for Iran to discuss these issues. And um, this, this issue needs to be further discussed. And as I said at the beginning of the first hour, I strongly recommend you to go over these slides. We will discuss every single aspect here in detail extensively. And uh, we'll continue because with these slides we go here and there and, and expand uh, the scope of discussion to cover the, uh, the, the region, the Middle East, and also the rest of the world. So this is something that, is, uh, that can be used as a template. All right, I'll see you on Friday. Don't be late at 9.40. We'll start on Friday in the morning.